Good afternoon, systems engineers of the world. Welcome. So far today, we've enjoyed the welcome address. The Pioneer Awards, congratulations to all. The Founder Awards, congratulations. And then the Best Paper Awards, congratulations to all concerned. And then the President's Address. We are now at the high point, the plenary keynote. And the structure of the keynote consists of a short introduction, then the keynote by Bernie Fanaroff, lasting about 40 minutes, and then 15 minutes question and answers. Please ask your questions in writing on Zoom. Please use chat to say hello to all the other attendees and create some online buzz by tweeting. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bernie Fanaroff to you. Bernie has a very wide experience. He obtained a PhD in radio astronomy from Cambridge University in England on the morphology of radio galaxies. After returning to South Africa and lecturing at the University of the Witterabatersrand for a year or two, he decided to rather support the struggle against the apartheid government. He became an organizer and then national secretary of MAWU, the Metal and Allied Workers Union. In 1987, MAWU, with other related trade unions, formed NUMSA, the National Union of Mine Workers of South Africa. NUMSA was then the largest and probably the most powerful trade union in South Africa and played a substantial role in the events leading to the first democratic election in South Africa in 1994. Bernie became part of President Nelson Mandela's government as Deputy Director General in Mandela's office and Head of the Office of Reconstruction and Development Program, also in the office of President Mandela. The Reconstruction and Development Program was the ANC's socio-economic policy framework for building houses, clean water delivery, electrification, improved healthcare, and infrastructure construction. After some other senior appointments in the public service, in 2003, Bernie set up the South African SKA project office. The Square Kilometer Array is a synthetic aperture radio telescope with an antenna capture area, as the name says, of 1 million square meters. It had already become clear that it was to be situated in the Southern Hemisphere. The vision of Bernie and the South African SKA project was to host the radio telescope in South Africa and to also develop the advanced technology needed for the design of the telescope and its signal and data processing. A key portion of Bernie's SKA work had little to do with the telescope itself, but revolved around developing the people needed for astronomy. If you could show that slide, Nicole. And there you can see the development in Africa with radio astronomy, with Bernie in the white, with the white shirt, and you see a lot of people from various parts of Africa. Next, please. And there you see three PhD students. The rest are all master students, all in radio astronomy, all from Africa, from Ghana, from, Mozambique, from uh, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, and Mauritius, etc. Thank you. Bernie retired as the project director of the South African component of the SKA in 2015. I will not discuss his academic credentials and achievements. You can read that in his CV. But I would like to mention that he is a fellow of the Royal Society in London. That is a very special honor. We are honored to have such an eminent person present the keynote with the intriguing title, System Engineering and Society. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ed. Uh, I'm very grateful to have been given this opportunity to address such an important conference. I'm not a system engineer, and all I know about system engineering is the words but I'm a great supporter of system engineering and I believe it has the potential to be much more important and much more widely used 
than it currently is. So I'm going to talk about two projects in which I've been involved, where system engineering played a key role in the success of the projects. And then I want to raise the problem of how to use system engineering and the logic of system engineering to help us in the crucial problem of how we efficiently deliver major infrastructure programs. At the end of 2002, South Africa decided to bid to host the world's largest science instrument, uh, which Adders described the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope. The big radio telescopes around the world had been completed in the 1970s and 80s. And the question astronomers asked themselves was, what's next? So the radio astronomers decided that they wanted to build a radio telescope, which was orders of magnitude larger and more sensitive than anything available at the time, so that they could map the structure of the universe as it evolved from a very hot, very dense and very homogeneous soup uh, into the structure of the universe as we see it today. Uh, highly structured with galaxies, clusters of galaxies, clusters of clusters of galaxies, and even super, super clusters. So to do that, the astronomers decided to build the telescope, as I described, with a collecting area of a square kilometer, because they wanted to gather as many as possible of the photons which had traveled through the universe for more than 13 billion years. Those radio signals are, of course, very weak, and they're swamped by a great deal of noise from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, but also from man-made interference, GPS satellites, military satellites, TV and radio, cell phones, and so on. So picking these very weak signals out of the sky and making sense of them is a very complex and difficult process. The international astronomers decided to build an array of telescopes, that is a couple of thousand small telescopes, about 15 meters in diameter, rather than one very big dish with an area of a square kilometer. They also asked themselves how much funding they could hope for from a project which would have to be multinational. What could they get out of the participating governments? they thought about one to two billion euros would be realistic. But that meant that they would have to find ways of dramatically decreasing the cost of building the telescope dishes and the radio receivers and all the other electronics that go with a modern radio telescope. Now, usually in radio astronomy, you want to have dishes which have very accurate surfaces. And uh, as I'll describe our Meerkat telescope, it has a surface with an accuracy of less than half a millimeter. You want very accurate surfaces, you want very stiff surfaces, and you want to be able to point them very accurately. But the astronomers internationally decided that one of the ways of cutting the costs of the square kilometer array was by making the dishes fairly cheap and floppy and correcting all of the problems that the, uh, that would cause in the data processing. They also felt that they could probably get off the shelf electronics that had been developed for commercial or military applications so that they could make the process cheaper in that way too. They didn't give very much thought to infrastructure which would be required, electricity, optical fiber, roads, buildings, and so on. I was asked to lead South Africa's bid to host the SKA at the beginning of 2003, which was about 10 years after the project started. We assembled a small but very dedicated and very capable team. And in 2006, South Africa with eight other African countries was shortlisted together with Australia. We needed the other eight African countries because the telescope will consist of thousands of dishes spread over about 3,000 kilometers in a spiral configuration. In 2004, we decided to build our own precursor telescope 
so that we could develop the expertise both in the science and the technology which was required to become a leading astronomy nation. So we called our precursor the Meerkat Telescope and we intended to build 64 dishes, 13 and a half meters in diameter. At the site we had chosen uh, for the telescope for the SKA in the Arid Karoo, which is the central part of South Africa. It has about 45% of South Africa's land area and less than 2% of our population. It's a sheep farming area. There's very little water. There's very low carrying capacity even for sheep. We chose an area in the farmlands, which is about 80 kilometers away from the nearest small town, Carnarvon, which has a population of about 4,000 people and is about nine hours drive from Cape Town and from Johannesburg. So it really is far away from everything. We took a rather novel approach to both the Meerkat and to our SKA proposal. Australia and most of the other participating countries, there were 13, had a history in radio astronomy and lots of radio astronomy expert gurus. We had one second-hand NASA Deep Space Network dish, a 26-meter diameter dish, which NASA left behind in uh, 1976 when they left South Africa because of apartheid. It was situated near Pretoria and had been converted for radio astronomy. And we had three or four radio astronomers, so we didn't have any gurus. So all of the gurus knew exactly what they had to build for the square kilometer array. And instead of focusing on what they had to build, they focused on finding the magic technologies which would provide the performance that was required, but would reduce the costs. Because we had the advantage that we had never built a radio telescope before, particularly not an interferometer, which is what these arrays are, and uh, uh, interferometers are very complex, we had to uh, go a different route. We didn't have the gurus who told us what we should build. It's also useful to understand that up to that time, most telescopes had been built on what you might call an academic basis. So although contractors were involved, the telescopes were built by academics, parts of them in their own laboratories and workshops and to academic timetables. We believed that once you start building arrays of hundreds or thousands of dishes, it becomes an industrial scale project and it needs a very different approach. Very early on, our project manager at the time, Anita Lewitz, brought Professor Mike Ings to talk to us about system engineering, which I'd never heard of at that time. But it sounded very logical and very sensible to me. So I decided that we would follow a system engineering process in building the Meerkat. We poached Thomas Kussel from the CSIR to lead our system engineering team, and that was a very good choice. The system engineering team then asked us, what is your user requirement? What do you want to do with this instrument? They spend quite a lot of time on the user requirement specification and then on the concept and then move to the system specification, subsystem specifications and so on. So we didn't start with the design, unlike other countries who were building uh, precursors. We built two prototypes, a single dish near Pretoria, and then a seven dish array on the site in the Karoo, so that we could learn how to build very far away from the big cities. We originally thought that we would focus on the telescope only, and that others would provide the roads, power lines, optical fiber, and other infrastructure. I must say, I never really believed that that would happen. And quite soon we brought the whole infrastructure design and construction into our system engineering process. Uh, data processing is a very important function because the huge volumes of data that come from the Meerkat and that will come from the SKA are quite unprecedented. So, so uh, software and uh, hardware for computing is, is very crucial. 
At first, of course, our data processing team resisted the system engineering process, but we got them on board through a combination of brute force and showing them that the system engineering process was actually working and adding a lot of value. Most of our hardware and software design was done in-house, which was crucial, and by well-coordinated small and agile project teams, which was also crucial. We were able to create a narrative. I'm a great believer in narratives for getting people on board. And this narrative was brought into by everybody from our principals in government to the members of our project teams. Our approach to building the Meerkat so it was thus different from the international thinking. Instead of looking for magic solutions and silver bullets, the team focused on meticulous system engineering process and fanatical attention to detail in the design and construction process to bring down the costs and improve performance. So it was that attention to detail and to innovative design that brought down our costs rather than any magical technology solutions. The team succeeded so well that the Meerkat is twice as sensitive as it was specced for the same cost, which means that it can operate at four times the speed. This was achieved without increasing the cost and without pushing out the schedule except by one year when we made a fairly radical design change to the dishes to achieve much better performance in making images of the sky. So system engineering made all of these successes possible. The seven dish prototype CAT7 worked when it was switched on. It was meant as an engineering prototype, but it worked so well that it was used for science for several years. So the slide you can see there is our base station in the Karoo. The array of telescopes is on the other side of the hill. What you can see there is a very long building where we assembled the dishes. And on the extreme right of the slide, you'll see the top of a buried building. Uh, and Nicole, if you can go to the next slide. In the buried building, we have a very large Faraday cage in which there are racks and racks of uh, computer hardware. There's also an uninterruptible power supply, 2.5 megawatts. Uh, diesels there and our transformers from the main grid. And that's me with Simon Ratcliffe, the head of our software team. I'm pretending to understand what he's telling me, but uh, the team is very expert. So that's all in the buried building underground so that none of the interference from the switching can interfere with the telescopes and none of the interference from the um, high tension power systems can interfere. When the Meerkat construction was completed, Rob Adam, who succeeded me as a director in 2016, was told by our overseas colleagues that we wouldn't get data that was usable for science for three to four years after the launch in July 2018. They were all rather surprised when the telescope was launched and produced stunning images of the center of the Milky Way, which went into a nature paper, as well as lots of other beautiful images. So both CAT7 and the Meerkat worked well from day one because of system engineering. Of course, the commissioning process has continued ever since as more modes and new sets of radio receivers are commissioned. So we now have a 64 dish telescope spread over eight kilometers which is the best of its kind in the world. The Max Planck Institute in Germany is adding 20 more dishes to the array to extend it to 17 kilometers and 84 dishes. And they built a further set of radio receivers at a different frequency. And several institutions besides Max Planck uh, are building equipment to go on the back of the telescope. Our team had a, a very innovative back end for the telescope which allows many simultaneous experiments to be run on the data at the same time. The Meerkat worked so well from early on that we were able to persuade the rest of the SKA community with a bit of effort to adopt the system engineering process for the whole SKA program. And that is now the backbone of its design 
and eventual construction. Next slide, please, Nicole. So these are the dishes coming out of the dish assembly shed and be carried on an articulated truck out to the site where they're uh, put together with a, a pedestal. Next slide, please. And that's what a meerkat dish looks like. You'll see it's what's called an offset Gregorian design. It's got two mirrors, the primary mirror, uh, which is 13 and a half meters in diameter, and then a smaller secondary mirror, which focuses the radio waves onto the radio receivers. And the radio receivers are on a turntable. You can have four different frequencies uh, operating. And these work at uh, liquid helium temperatures. So you have helium compressors and the signals are digitized on the dish and then sent over optical fiber to the data processing in the buried building. So you have digitizers on the dish as well. Thank you, Nicole. Next slide. So that's the, the uh, Meerkat array in the Karoo. The KPIs were performance, the science performance, the schedule, the reliability, and the time to commissioning. And I think it's true to say that this is the first major radio astronomy project where system engineering was deployed as a central part of the technical development. Next slide, please. So on the performance, our construction schedule we planned six years, we took seven and a half years with the one year, as I said, for our design change. The performance, which is sensitivity, is in rather strange units. The spec performance was 200 square meters per degree Kelvin, and we achieved 390 square meters per degree Kelvin. So because you have double the sensitivity, you can operate four times as fast. So in the operational phase, we'll catch up on the schedule delay. Next slide, please. The reliability is exceptional. Right from the beginning, we had 90% availability. Next slide. And then, of course, the time to science was about three or four years faster than our international colleagues predicted. So at the uh, launch uh, on the 18th of June, 2018, uh, they had that spectacular picture of the center of the Milky Way with all kinds of new stars and exploding stars in it. And that went into publication in Nature in September 2019. Thank you. Next slide. So on all of these things, we achieved our goals. How did system engineering help us? The conceptual design review and the structured approach to evaluate all the options was crucial. Analyzing the user requirements in detail and the detailed breakdown to system and component requirements was crucial. A detailed system level design with solid contractual specifications for both infrastructure and the dish was crucial. We had to manage each of the subsystems with these small and agile teams, which were also fairly independent. So Thomas and his team tailored a system engineering process which was followed by all the subsystem teams. And then, of course, we had very detailed um, acceptance, integration, and verification planning. Thank you. Next slide. Now I'm going to talk about something very different, and that is the provision of emergency ventilators for South Africa to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. A very different project to radio astronomy because it had very aggressive timescales, strict regulatory requirements with a lot of documentary inputs and high quality requirements for the medical application. So what happened was that in April, when the COVID pandemic struck, I was asked by our Minister for Trade and Industry to help to source oxygen ventilators. He was being inundated with proposals from local and international groups uh, companies and institutions, and there was a tremendous amount of noise in the system, and nobody quite knew what we should use and how we should get together uh, groups that could manufacture these in South Africa. 
I suggested that we should use a system engineering process uh, to get some order into this and to reduce the amount of noise in the system. And that we already had a team that could do it very well, which was the team that built the Meerkat. So the minister accepted this and he appointed the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory to manage what was called the National Ventilator Project. And the aim of that was to manufacture up to 20,000 ventilators very quickly in South Africa for provision to our national and uh, um, smaller hospitals. So <clears throat> within a week, Willem Esterhazer, who's a lead engineer in the Radio Astronomy Observatory, and Thomas Kussel, our lead system engineer, and their teams worked with clinicians to develop a reliable user requirement specification. They then called for proposals and received 95 proposals. They shortlisted 20 and they chose six suppliers all within two weeks. The suppliers made prototypes, which the team tested and they made in fact their own prototypes. And the team negotiated a fast track approval process with the uh, medical instruments regulator. It turned out to be not such a fast track, but that's another story. The team also negotiated contracts for manufacture and ensured that the uh, prototypes were properly uh, qualified for industrialization and manufacture. The process was set back a couple of weeks uh, by the regulatory process and by the need to confirm the funding, but manufacturing is now underway. Uh, we're expecting 2,000 ventilators by the end of this month and 10,000 by the end of August. Next slide, please. Uh, I think let's just go to the next slide, Nicole. Uh, I'll come back to this. Let's go to the next one. So this is the uh, time scale. You can see the development process from the requirements analysis right through to regulatory approval, contracting and industrialization with production during July and August. Next slide. And this is the projected peak in infections and the requirements for the ventilators. So you'll see we expect to have the ventilators ready in time for our peak, which hasn't been reached in South Africa yet. These ventilators are um, being made for our public hospitals, but the manufacturers will also make additional supplies for the private hospitals, and we'll also be sending them to other African countries. The cost of each unit is about 10,000 Rand. That's about $550 which is a lot cheaper than most of the others that could be imported. The ventilators are continuous positive airways pressure ventilators called CPAP devices. They're not the intubated ventilators, although we're now running a second stream uh, for more complicated devices. The CPAP devices were designed to be very simple to use and not to need electricity because both doctors and electricity may be in short supply in rural hospitals or in field hospitals. In fact, there's a lot of evidence now that CPAP ventilators and high flow nasal oxygen are the way to go with COVID patients because of the very poor survival rates from intubated ventilators. Uh, I can't help contrasting our system engineering driven process with the ventilator challenge, which was quickly issued by the UK government. I hope people in the UK will forgive me for saying this. Uh, everyone in the UK responded very quickly, but the government ended up having to cancel most of the orders and withdraw the call because the machines were not what the clinicians wanted. So system engineering process won again. Next slide, please. So, this is one of the types of ventilators that we're producing, a Venturi device. Next slide. And this is an oxygen air blender. So you can see they're very simple and robust, easy to operate. People can operate them in the field as long as they've got oxygen plugged in from the wall. 
Next slide, please. I'm now going to talk about the challenge of delivering infrastructure. The first democratic government in South Africa was elected in 1994 when apartheid ended. President Mandela was our first president. The reconstruction and development program, as I'd said, was government's uh, main program. One of its key pillars was the infrastructure pillar to build the social infrastructure like schools, roads, houses and clinics, water, uh, which had been denied to the majority of people under apartheid, and also to renew and to extend the economic infrastructure so that we could stimulate the economy and uh, draw in investment and build economic growth. I was the head of the RDP office in the office of the president. Although the RDP was closed after two and a half years, mainly as a result of professional jealousy between ministers, well, that's my view anyway, uh, we achieved a lot. What held us back was the scarcity of project management skills in government and the realization that government is often good at delivering services but is generally not good at delivering projects. And that's not unique to South Africa. I'll talk about that a bit later. What I learned was that we were very ambitious at the beginning. We wanted to integrate all our projects and everything worked together. It's what the UK calls joined up government. But I learned that joined up government and uh, integrated projects are extremely complex and difficult to implement because all of the incentives are against integration or horizontal coordination between departments and agencies. They're into empire building, not into cooperation. When I, was, uh, when I left the RDP office, I went to the Ministry of Safety and Security. And one of the jobs I did there was to chair the uh, Integrated Criminal Justice System project. And we toured the US and the UK when we were preparing that project. And we found that even the FBI had struggled with a simpler project. Uh, so the success rate on these big integrated projects was very low. Delivering projects efficiently and effectively can be done, as we've seen with the SKA. As I've said, South Africa is not the only one which struggles with this. Uh, you can look at the airport on St. Helena Island in the South Atlantic, which was built by the UK and then couldn't be used or the H2S fast train, or the Crossrail in London, or the new Berlin airport, which I believe is 10 years over schedule. Generally, government departments are designed for compliance, not project delivery, even though they use contractors to actually do the delivery. They usually lack in-house project management and system engineering expertise, and often their subject knowledge is theoretical rather than practical. So they struggle to develop a user requirement specification or a concept and to design the project, to write the tender and the contract, and then to manage the contractor. So very often they don't actually know exactly what it is they want to build and how they should build it. And then they're at the mercy of the contractors. Uh, to give you an example of this, I know of at least one dam that was built without the reticulation for the water being planned or budgeted for. So you have a dam full of water and no way of getting it to the people who need it. In South Africa, we've allocated a huge amount of money to infrastructure in the past 10 years, but we have little to show for it. Since the rapid and effective delivery of infrastructure for the Football World Cup in 2010, uh, all but one of our large construction companies have failed. So like many other countries, South Africa wants to build infrastructure, both social and economic, to grow out of a recession, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns. Funding is available. The question is, do we have the capability to well manage and efficiently build this infrastructure. To build confidence in the economy 
and to rebuild our manufacturing industry, the projects have to be well managed and well implemented. Both the private and the public sector in South Africa have lost expertise over the years because of the lack of a pipeline of big projects. So the challenge is this for the SE community. System engineering has worked so well in delivering the Meerkat and the National Ventilator Project. How can we use system engineering to help us deliver much bigger projects efficiently and well? We're not building nuclear submarines, so we're not talking about the most rigorous and formal system engineering processes, but the logic of system engineering and the methods of system engineering, I believe hold many lessons for how we go into these large infrastructure programs. How do we transfer system engineering logic and methodology into a form which can become well-known and successful and embedded in the delivery of railways, ports, dams, roads, power stations, schools, hospitals, and housing developments. That is a challenge I want to leave with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? I'm happy to take them. Can't hear you. Un unmute yourself. Mute, unmute. There we are. Sorry. Stupid. The question is from Eduardo Bellon. He says, if you had to call out one thing that got you convinced on applying a systems engineering approach, what would that be and why? Well, the very first time Mike Ings presented the system to us, bear in mind, I'd never heard of system engineering, but the way he presented it, it was so obvious. It was logical, it was systematic. It started from where you should start and ended up where you should end up. And it just made so much sense to me. And that's what I think is appealing about system engineering. As I say, I don't know a lot about the more technical details, but the whole system is just logical. It's obvious, it's common sense. Yes, thank well, it you. should be common sense. I wish more people would use it. Yes, but as you know, common sense is the least common of all senses. Yeah. The next question um, is from Duncan Kemp. He says, how did you decide on the CPAP, the continuous flow, what's it, the CPAP ventilators? Was that part of your initial one week assessment? Yes, we, the Willem Esterhuizen's team of engineers worked very closely with expert um, ICU clinicians. And even at that early stage, they said the survival rate on the intubated ventilators is very low. And they were looking at alternatives and the CPAP and the high flow nasal oxygen were already beginning to show better results in the intubation. So we worked from their specification because we wanted to build something that the clinicians wanted and they wanted the CPAP. The other advantage of the CPAP, of course, was that the intubated ventilators require expert um, clinicians to insert the tubes, and then you've got to have expert clinicians and nurses on hand all the time to look after the patients who are sedated. The CPAP ventilators are much, much easier to use and much easier to, um, to operate. There are some things which I didn't mention. For instance, you have to make sure that you don't expel the used air back into the ward and, and in, um, uh, infect everybody else. So there have to be filters. Uh, there has to be a humidifier and so on. But those are our details. Thank you, Bernie. There's a question from Roland Darbin. 
for the area surrounding the Meerkat, where did you go? How did you mitigate the future risk of interference? I presume RF interference. In this case, the system is much larger than the deployed system. So, <clears throat> government passed a law through Parliament, uh, which created a protected zone in the province of the Northern Cape. And that law gives, gives the power to the Minister for Science and Innovation to declare protected areas where you can't do certain things. So you can't operate uh, machines or a transmitter, for instance, uh, close to the telescope because that would interfere. So there's a very arduous process that you have to go through where you consult with communities and you consult with stakeholders and so on. But then the minister can publish regulations in the government gazette which prohibit activities which would interfere with a telescope within specified areas. Generally, there'll be a buffer zone of about 30 kilometers um, around the patches of dishes. But we have bought 130,000 hectares uh, in the area. And that area will, of course, be a protected area. It'll be a wildlife um, nature reserve, uh, which will be uh, managed by South African National Parks. Uh, and the access control to that will be very strict. What about cell phones, Bernie? You can't use cell phones on site. So we've had to design alternative communication methods, both for use on site and for emergency services in the area. Bear in mind that the mobile phone companies haven't really got coverage of that area because it's very sparsely populated. So it's not economically viable to have cell phone masts all over the place there. But we have provided a lower frequency communication system and a satellite based internet connection system for all the farmers and uh, the people who live on the farms, the workers on the farms. So everybody can have connections both to the trunked uh, telephone lines and to the internet. Thank you. There's a question from Maria Romero who asks, how do you convince a team to implement a systems engineering approach when you have others that are against it or just want to implement it their own way? Uh, the only team that really gave us a hard time was the software team because they said <laughs> they know how to do software. They might as well stay watching TV or playing games on the Xbox or whatever. Uh, and they don't see why you have to write it all down. It just wastes their time, documentation, and so on. So we um, did two things. One is I told them if they wanted to work on another project, they were free to do so. But if they were going to work on this project, they were going to go with system engineering. But also it became clear to them that the value that was being added by Thomas's team and the system engineering processes was so much that they would benefit from it themselves. The software engineers came up with what you might call a hybrid SE system, uh, using all their agiles and sprints and all the other things they do. But it's basically the system engineering process with some modifications. And the other small teams also made small modifications. That's why I said earlier that Thomas and his team came up with a system engineering process for each of the subsystems and each of them had their own system engineers. Bernie, there's a question, comment from Julian Johnson. He says, do you know, <laughs> do you know of no large infrastructure projects that have applied systems engineering and that have been relatively successful? For instance, my understanding is that system engineering was applied successfully on the development of the UK France channel, the channel tunnel. I'm sure that's true. I'm not an expert on it and I didn't do much research on it. I'm just speaking about the things that I've come across. And generally I can say in South Africa that system engineering hasn't been used. Uh, I know, for instance, that for the two big power stations that were built by our national 
electricity utility. Uh, I was told repeatedly when I was on the board of the utility that there was a system engineering process and I kept asking for it to be shown to us and it never was. So I'm convinced there wasn't one. But I think that that's common. And uh, if there was a system engineering process with Crossrail and H2S and the airport on St. Helena, then it wasn't a very successful SE process. But I'm sure it you're right. I'm sure a lot of system engineering processes have been used. And I apologize to all those I've insulted. Yeah, I think that the Dutch uh, railway project uh, was also an example of huge infrastructure that formerly used systems engineering. There's a question from screen can, one. If I may just say this, Ad, the, the challenge that we have in Holland, I can imagine that you have lots and lots of engineers and lots and lots of system engineers. We don't have lots and lots of system engineers in South Africa. And the challenge has been how do we get that expertise embedded in our execution of infrastructure projects here? Thank you. The next question is from screen one. Would you recommend systems engineering professionals rather than project management professionals for social projects? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> it's a loaded one. I suspect it depends on the kind of project. Let, let, let me say this, probably for the very simple projects, project management is, is more, uh, more appropriate or more indispensable, let me say. Once you get anything that's a bit more complex, I think you need system engineering processes. But even there, you know, if you look at some of our simpler projects like building school classrooms, you find from one province to the next, there can be a factor of two, three, four, five in the cost of a classroom built to the same specification. So for a project like that, you probably need a very tough project manager. For a more complex project, certainly railways, power stations, transmission lines, I think you need system engineering. Here is a question, not so much only to you, Bernie, but to the rest of INCO's management from Kirsten, Thomas's wife. Are there any plans to set up a system engineering working group and funding for research and development into system engineering for the architectural engineering and construction industry? Not that I'm aware of, but I think it's a very good idea and I'll certainly put it forward. We have a thing called the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission. Yeah. Uh, and I'll Nita. certainly present it there, yeah. And that's run by ANITA. The, well, yeah. the technical group is run by ANITA. Question from Dan Damien Stewart. Governments continue to focus on compliance for systems engineering related projects, which is more often unsuccessful and inefficient. How should they shift focus to fully enable systems engineering success? I think the problem with compliance is that it becomes a tick box exercise when you don't really understand what you're doing. Whether it's in procurement, whether it's in design, whether it's in the engineering, the contract management, I find that very often government processes are tick box processes. And they can add layers of paperwork, documentation, without really adding a lot of value. So the real issue is, I suppose, how do you find the professionals and how do you embed the processes in a way that people understand and can use to add value? I'm afraid I don't have the answers to a lot of these questions. That's why I put it out as a challenge so that the system engineering community can think about them. That's no problem. Thank you, Bernie. There's a question from David Long, all the way from Ohio. He says, you came into systems thinking from a non-systems engineering role. How should we engage, we INCOs, with other non-systems engineering people to get them to engage the so-called common sense that you spoke about? 
I think part of it is to explain to people what system engineering means. And there has to be some flexibility in it. If you, what, one thing I've found about engineers, and you'll pardon me for saying this, is that when they explain things, they tend to become very technical. And I've found that the way to get people to buy in is to have a narrative which people understand and which motivates them. So what is the narrative of system engineering? Part of a narrative is to explain it in terms that people can understand, they can follow the logic in a simple way, and then to show examples of successful projects which have been done, like the Dutch Railways uh, and the other projects that I didn't know about and for which I've apologised. But I think that there is a narrative for system engineering, and I think it would be a very useful narrative to publicise. But narratives are important. Bernie, a question from Andreas. What MBSE model-based systems engineering tool did you use? Well, you'd first have to tell me what MBSE is. Uh, well, you used Core from Vitec, actually. It's a model-based systems engineering software tool. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'd know it's best because I'd trained our system engineers. Question from Paul Davies. In what way does systems engineering help bridge the gap between government or other decision takers and the tech and engineering communities? I'm not sure that it does bridge the gap. In my experience, because you often lack expertise or usually lack expertise in the government department, people are only too happy to have a tender issued to a contractor, and then they can wash their hands of the project. Because they say, I was told to do this, I've got a contractor, the contractor is going to do it. And they're not in a position very often to manage the contractor tightly. They're not in a position to ensure that what is produced at the end is what they actually wanted. So again, the narrative is important to persuade people in government that they need this process. But then we have to be able to show examples of success. Nothing creates momentum like success. If you can point to specific concrete examples and say, by doing this, we were able to execute this project, this project quickly. It was successful. Look what it's delivering. I think that's the most important way. But bear in mind also that I think that we have lost a lot of expertise in the private sector. One of the problems we have in South Africa now is a lot of our big contracting companies have moved out of the country or have failed, and we have to rebuild that expertise. The next question is from C. Stokes. Was this funded entirely by the government? Is any of the data available for public use? I presume that is relevant to Meerkat. So Meerkat was designed and funded and built by South Africans, paid for by the Fiscus. Uh, the SKA will be paid for by all of the governments that are participating in the project. The uh, data from the Meerkat uh, is available to the uh, investigating teams for a limited period, which is usually about a year. And after that, it goes into the public domain but also any astronomer, any scientist can apply for observing time on the Meerkat telescope. The engineering expertise is generally open source. And I found that technical people in the astronomy community are very, very open uh, with each other and very open to helping people. So I'm sure that the uh, technical information from the Meerkat telescope and the developments there uh, would be available if people are interested. The contact person there would be Thomas Kissel. Bernie, a question from Stueti Gupta. In very large infrastructure projects, how do you factor in the changes in technology that take place during the development life cycle of the project? Any examples from Meerkat? So with Meerkat, we had to make up our minds how adventurous we were going to be. 
we limited the risky technologies. We had one or two risky technologies. Generally, we went for more mature technologies and we aim to improve the performance by the meticulous attention to detail in the design and construction. There were some risky technologies and we had to do those in a way that we essentially built from month to month so that we were always checking that we were on track with those technologies and we wouldn't go a long way and then check and find they didn't work. I think with technologies that are changing rapidly, you have to have people who've got a future view. And I must say our teams are very good, both our hardware and software teams were in touch with the industry. Um, they had very good relationships with companies like Nvidia and Xilinx and so on. So they always knew what the roadmaps were and they were able to identify technologies uh, which were relatively future proof. But ultimately you have to make a call and say we're freezing the design at this point, we're freezing the technology. And we design in a way that allows us to upgrade. So we accept that we'll have to upgrade the Meerkat systems and the Meerkat systems are designed in such a way that you can upgrade them. For instance, when new chips come along, you can put in the new chips without, without having to redesign the entire system. Thank you, Bernie. There's a question from Drew Downer. You mentioned that you used a brute force method with the software team to gain their cooperation on, in the systems engineering process. Do you have opinions for other methods that may or may not be successful with breeding cooperation, integration between other technical and non-technical stakeholders? Yeah, we were working with small and agile teams and they were very motivated. As I said, they bought into the narrative. They were very excited by the project. I often came in on a Monday and would find that one or more of the teams had worked through the whole weekend, not because anyone had asked them to do so, but because they felt they were behind with their schedule. More than once I came in after the Christmas holidays in January and found that a team had worked throughout the Christmas holidays. I'm sure their families weren't very happy about it, but they did it anyway. And again, no one had asked them to do so, but they felt they were behind. And they were motivated by the excitement of the project. So when you give people a project that's really exciting, it's not money that motivates them, it's the excitement of creating something really innovative and something that's really going to work. So our teams are motivated in that way. And when I say brute force, I don't mean that I had to hit them with a stick. <laughs> ultimately have to say to them, look, you either do it my way or you have to go and work on another project because this is how we're going to run the project. So it's up to you to choose. And I think that ultimately as a manager and a leader, you have to be prepared to do that. You know, if people want to work on a project and you have a certain way of doing things on the project, mm. I always listen to people. I'm very open to hearing from people. One thing I've learned more and more as I've got older is how little I know and how much I can learn by listening to people. And I've learned a tremendous amount by listening to the very, very wonderful people we've had in our team, both scientists and engineers. So I'm always open to listening to people and to hearing what they say. And when it makes sense, I'm happy to accept it. But once you've made a decision, we're going to go the system engineering route then we're going to go the system engineering route. If you say it would make a lot more sense if we modified it for our subsystem, that's fine. I'm happy to say, go and talk to Thomas, come up with an alternative. As long as it's within the general precepts of the system engineering, that's fine. Bernie, there's a question from Dave Fadley. How did you, or did you, overcome the pressure from key stakeholders to just get on with it, <coughs> sorry, just get on with it and not spend the time and money on systems engineering? Well, luckily we had people in the Department of Science and Technology as it was then, uh, who really understood what we were doing. The Director General was a physicist, uh, his successor was a physicist, 
and we were able to explain to them what we were doing and why we were doing it. They came under some pressure from the treasury uh, to say, you know, why is it taking so long? And we said, we can do something quick and nasty for you and we'll end up with something that is really a white elephant. It'll look nice, but nobody will want to use it. Or we can do it properly and give you something that'll be not only world class, but a world beater. And the uh, leadership and our ministers of science and technology were immensely supportive. Uh, one of our uh, ministers who was there for the longest period, uh, Mrs. Naledi Pando, Dr. Naledi Pando, uh, was extremely supportive and very influential in the ruling party. And she really protected the project and not only protected it, but sold it both within government and within South Africa and internationally. Thank you very much, Bernie. We have answered 14 questions. There are 13 remaining. Those remaining will be answered in due course by right, written answers. Bernie, thank you very much. You have demonstrated once again the wisdom of the back to first principles, the common sense approach. Thank you for your insight and for your support of systems engineering. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much and thank you for the honor of addressing your Congress. And I hope to learn even more about system engineering in the future. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you.